I can't stop playing Disgaea 4. The past three weeks, I've put an unhealthy amount of time into this game, killing enemies with some absolutely bonkers attacks, min-maxing my stats, creating new characters and monsters, and exploiting the game mechanics to get away with way more experience than should be possible at my level. And, well, I admit it, I'm hooked. Disgaea 4 Complete Plus, a mouthful of a name, I know, is a strategy RPG lover's dream. It seems that Nipponichi has done it again, or at least they did it way back in 2011, because this is essentially just a port of Disgaea 4, A Promise Untold, originally released on PS3 and Vita. But today, we're taking a look at the Switch version. Keep in mind, I won't be spoiling any critical story elements in this review, but I will be using situational examples and gameplay throughout the 40-odd hours that I spent with it. What is a promise? What value does a broken promise say about our character and our values? These are the questions that are posed in Disgaea 4, as it follows Vampire Extraordinaire Lord Valva Torres, a once feared and powerful tyrant who lost his strength. Nowadays, Valva Torres is a pretty instructor, teaching talking penguins how to say dude at the end of every sentence, and having an unhealthy obsession with sardines because he's not allowed to drink blood. It's bizarre, it's, it's definitely strange, but it's not really unexpected if you look at previous Disgaea games. If you compare it to all the other Disgaeas, it's weird, it's wacky, it's anime AF. It's exactly what you'd expect, for better or for worse. The one thing that I didn't expect though, at least in this game, is how political Valvatoras' adventure is. As a cleverly titled Corruptorman, advocates for the genocide of Prinnies, Valvatorez vows to fight back by leading a group of rebels to overthrow the government of the netherworld. Now that's a really high level overview of just what you get from the first couple of chapters. In reality, you know, of course it's a little bit more dynamic than that, and even a touch relatable, despite being predictable. Throughout Valvatorez's journey, you'll encounter a truly misfit cast of characters. They all appeal to certain archetypes, like Fenric, Valvatoris' second hand, and Emisel, the corrupt president's son, who, I guess now that I think about it, sort of acts like a political hostage throughout this game. To be honest, the characters here aren't anything special. Valvatoris has this bizarre trait where he thinks everyone is telling the truth all the time, and this makes him very easily manipulated. Fenric oozes this mysterious uncertainty, and he has a really strong influence over Valvatoras, so it really made me skeptical of him and his motives. Then there's this one demon girl who dreams of becoming a final boss, like from a video game. But she acts like a child, so she's just kind of annoying, I guess? <laughs> Sometimes it felt like characters would just talk way too much, but they wouldn't really say anything of substance, or it would just take forever for characters to respond. So if I ever felt like a certain scene was dragging and just filling time and taking forever, I'd just skip it. I don't have the time to wait around for anime waifus to yell or scream or for some group of enemies to introduce themselves, even though in 10 minutes they'll be dead because I'll kill them. Now the scenarios and the situations that Velvet Torres and his group ends up in, they're more engaging than the characters sometimes. Like there are these really wacky things going on here and a lot of the time I feel like it's just the developers poking fun at video game tropes and stereotypes. Minor spoilers here, uh, for example, at one point in the game there's a virus infecting citizens of the netherworld, but rather than making them sick or outright killing them, the virus turns them into an adversary that has been fighting us for the past couple of chapters. So it's like, wait, what? What does the virus do? Why does it turn you into this, this guy? And then you're sitting there and like a million of these guys are appearing and you have to kill them all. And then your own group starts getting infected and starts morphing into this one guy. It doesn't really go beyond that, but it's a fun idea, and I like the out-of-the-box thinking. Once you get into the level to actually fight enemies, it's mostly standard RPG fare. You need to eliminate all the enemies on the map with your team. You can move your characters around and attack during your turn, and then the enemy team will all move at once, so it's turn-based. The over-the-top attacks, of course, are a highlight here. There are some crazy attack sequences that I have saved onto my Switch from using the record functionality. Um, I spent a lot of time grinding enemies in handheld mode, which is just really convenient because sometimes I'd only be able to play for a few minutes, but even during that couple of minutes, I can get a level or two out of the way. Anyway, you have a couple of unique options here. You can have both monsters and humanoids on your team, 
and there are just a ton of classes to pick between. You could be a caster, a ninja, a knight in shining armor, a dragon, a prinny, a witch, a thief, a zombie. Hell, you could even be a voluptuous catwoman. Don't worry, I know you guys like that. Now, the humanoids and monsters have a couple of differences. The humanoids can lift other creatures and throw them, or they could even stack like six characters on top of each other and unleash a devastating tower attack, as it's called. It's really funny to see just this giant tower of pain and destruction obliterate your enemies. The monsters, on the other hand, they can't lift anything, but they can fuse together with other monsters to create a stronger, larger, and tougher monster. Now, monsters can also turn into weapons that could be used by humanoids. So, for example, I could turn this monster of mine into a sword that Valvatoras can use. The nice thing about the human towers and the monster weapons is that the experience gained through these forms are distributed equally among the characters involved. So, if you have a weak character that you're trying to level up, a great strategy is actually to put them in a tower where they're safe, but they still get the experience. So you may have noticed that there's these uh, colored cubes and tiles on pretty much every level. The cubes apply different effects to the colored tile that they're on, and the effects can range from making enemies super strong, to healing you every turn, to increasing experience gain, even making you invulnerable. Now, things get really interesting here if you pick up and move blocks around, or destroy blocks. On many levels, it's possible to eliminate the monsters in a turn or two, with careful positioning and some calculated throws. Many levels are also reminiscent of a puzzle game because you may not be able to access certain areas or attack certain monsters without moving some of these cubes around. It's pretty neat, honestly. Like there's one level where you could destroy every single monster without even attacking them. Another level has you running between different green colored islands because no more than one character can stop on the blue sections of the map at the same time. These levels, there, there are a bunch of levels like this, and they all make the game so much more interesting. At the end of the day, Disgaea 4 is a numbers game. You'll need to increase your level, your stats, your mana, your item levels. There's just so many things to grind out, and everything has a number attached to it. For example, every time you kill a monster, you'll get mana. Mana is a currency, and one common use of mana is to upgrade your spells. These spells then take up more resources, like SP, to cast, so you have to really carefully balance your mana and your spell levels, or else you might not have enough SP to cast your upgraded spells. A better example might actually be the item world, this randomly generated endless dungeon that's tied to a specific item. By going in and completing the floors in an item world, that item will get a pretty huge boost in stats. To make things even more complicated, there are these special attributes called innocence tied to your items. The innocents determine the stats on the item. For example, and just hear me out here, the, the gladiator innocent will give an item the attack stat. So you want a whole bunch of gladiator innocents on your melee weapons. Now I'm not going to go any further into it because it's just too much to explain and <laughs> it's already gone on long enough. But you could take the innocents off of these items and place them onto another item, essentially doubling up, if that makes sense, and increasing their efficacy. This is how you get absolutely crazy stats, and for a while I was just addicted to seeing these numbers increase. Okay, so <laughs> I know that was a lot of information, but that's part of what makes this guy a click for me. Once you get it, you get it, and the game becomes a lot more enjoyable. It's not necessarily about getting the end game and destroying elite monsters. Well, it sort of is, but <laughs> it's also about exploiting and breaking the game so much that you become literal gods. Something that's very important to realize is that the Sky of Four assumes several things. It assumes that you've played a Disgaea game before. It assumes you know all the various terminology. It assumes you know how the stats work, how the different mechanics operate. And the resources for learning these sometimes critical mechanics are buried within these unintuitive menus. So let me explain a couple of things. Going with the political themes of the story, there's also a Senate and a campaign map built into the game. The Senate is a group of random NPCs that vote on different policies, and these policies can be anything from unlocking new characters and character classes, allowing buildings to be built in your base, unlocking new modes, increasing the quality of items in the shops, and there's a whole bunch of them. However, just like real life, sometimes you'll need to persuade senators to vote yes on your proposals. You'll also need a healthy amount of mana to initiate the voting process. Alongside the Senate, there's also the campaign map. This is a map board where you can place different buildings that give off different effects to the characters surrounding them. I didn't take advantage of this too much in the beginning of my playthrough, but by the halfway point, you're definitely going to want to try to optimize your campaign map 
Now, all these different buildings, they have different effects. Um, like some of them share experience across members. There are buildings that let you capture enemies, and there are even buildings that affect the ending of the game. The most useful building is probably the one that shares mana across other key members. Now, what I like to do is I fill this building with my powerful mages, and then I put a weaker character in there in this group so that the weaker character can get a slice of the mana and a bit of a boost to their skills. So this is great and all, and I love how in-depth some of these systems are. However, I wish the game features were explained properly, or at least more accessible. The perfect example is something called the character world. It's an endless dungeon that, based on your actions within, lets you modify the character's stats and power. Now, I had no idea that the character world was even a thing until I started researching more about the original Disgaea 4 game on PS3 and Vita. If this was a brand new title, I would have went through the entire game without knowing about it or taking advantage of it. So if you want to unlock the character world, here's how you do it. You have to reincarnate your character a couple of times. Now what this does is it'll set your character's level back down to 1, but it lets you switch classes and even keep some of your stats so you grow stronger and stronger over time after every reincarnation. After you reincarnate at least 100 levels, you'll unlock a bill in the Senate to open the character world. I'm all for having hidden features in games, but I would have liked a better explanation of reincarnating and how it could help my team. From my perspective, I was hesitant to reincarnate because the cost to reincarnate goes up each time you do it, so I didn't know if it would be better to wait until I was a higher level. To have a feature like the character world hidden behind this reincarnation, it seems a little silly to me. Now there are a couple of logistical things that I should mention about Disgaea 4 Complete Plus 2. The user interface is just way too cluttered on certain screens. I feel like if the text was a little bit smaller and the text boxes weren't so big, this wouldn't be as much of a problem. If you go into the campaign map, it's really hard to get an idea of what's going on because there's just so much stuff everywhere and you can't rotate the camera. Now in battles, you could rotate the camera, but it can still be really hard to see what's happening. In some levels, there might be a dozen characters in close proximity and it's just really hard to see what specific block they're on. If we could zoom out the camera, I feel like this wouldn't be as much of a problem. Now there is an alternative camera view that can help, it's more of a top-down perspective, but it's still really hard to see, especially when there's hills and varying altitudes. Even if you're just looking at your character's equipment, there's no getting away from these overzealous text boxes, because character equipment needs to be micromanaged. You'll be in the menus a lot. I wish there was an optimize button for my characters, but there's not. Every time you get a new piece of equipment, you have to go back into the menu to equip it or unequip it and transfer all of your innocence to it. Seeing as this is a port from almost 10 years ago, I feel like there should definitely be more quality of life options here to make managing your team easier. Now, it's no surprise that the Disgaea games are super intimidating. They're not user friendly and they're certainly not accessible to those unfamiliar with the genre. And Disgaea 4 Complete Plus is no exception. However, if you put in the time, the grind, and you have the right attitude, Disgaea 4 is easily one of the best strategy RPGs on the Switch. While it's labeled as Complete Plus, this does sort of feel more like a straight port than I'd like to admit, and I do wish that there were a few more quality of life perks added to make it easier to understand and navigate. But all in all, following Lord Valvatorez on his adventure was a great deal of fun, and I can't wait to see where Disgaea goes from here. The last game in the series was Disgaea 5, uh, that released a couple of years ago on both PS4 and Switch. I actually have a review of Disgaea 5 on the Switch, um, you can go ahead and check that out if you want, but that's from a couple of years ago. Now that's all from me, uh, thank you for clicking on this video, thank you for watching, and I will see you guys later. Peace!